I first met Neko Jiru in 1990. I was just starting out as an editor and a writer. Things were going great. I was full of spunk, fascinated by everything, exhilarated by my work. A movie nerd approaching 30, I was free of worries, dabbled in drugs, and felt totally open to life. One of the magazines I read at the time was Garo. If I ran across a manga I liked, I'd call the editors to get them to introduce me to the artist and get him to draw illustrations for my magazine. Takashi Nimoto and Hajime Yamano were favorites from Garo. I knew both personally and commissioned work from them often. At the time, Hajime Yamano drew manga about poor, stupid losers in a gritty, realistic millennial theater of desire. His way of relentlessly exposing the insignificance and smallness of the human creature in his manga in a despaired, nonsensical tone won him the ire of sensible people and a cult following. A self-styled renaissance man and misfit, reading a manga artist like Yamano was for me a healing activity. Exactly. That's exactly how it is, a common refrain when I read Yamano's manga. Years after his manga had stopped appearing in Garo in the 90s, one day Garo published a piece called Yamano in Nekojiru Mama. It was Nekojiru's debut. The title, Nekojiru Udon. A father cat barges into an udon shop holding a kitten in his mouth and asks the udon seller to neuter the kitten. The udon seller is taken aback at first, but finally grabs a knife and stabs Kitty. Kitty dies. A customer walks in and places an order. One kitty udon, the udon seller picks up, perks up. Coming right up. The end. Cute cats doing gruesome things. The characters were drawn with a wobbly, hesitant line that gave it a curiously powerful impact you didn't get from better drawn work. I remember being slightly dazed for a while after reading the manga. Wow, Yamano-san has started up again. Right away I knew I wanted him to draw a crazy manga for my magazine, so I gave him a call. Our meeting took place the next day in a cafe. He had brought his wife, whom he introduced. She was thin, short, boyish, the type of character you'd expect to see in a Moto Hagyo manga. Actually, the cat manga was drawn by Chiyomi, Nekojiro's real name, so I'm helping out a lot. It's a joint effort. Nekojiro seemed a bit shy that day but she left a good impression on me. My wife is usually pretty blunt with most people. She'll say it right to your face that she doesn't like you. So I just hope the meeting goes well. Despite his fears, Nekojiru and I hit it off right away. We got together relatively frequently after that, but I don't remember seeing her wearing a skirt during the whole time I knew her. She probably didn't own one. Plain was the perfect word to describe her. Following her debut, Nekojiru quickly established a strong base of support among a handful of people in the industry. One music writer I knew told me, I interviewed her once, I interviewed her once, and it was a love at first sight. Nekojiru was like a fragile little animal in need of someone to protect her. But behind this endearingly feminine side lurked a curious darkness. Something strange and dangerous had taken root in the depths of her soul. I was speechless when I realized the chasm of opaque desire that separated us. <clears throat> I want a knife. Nekojiru occasionally mumbled this under her breath. Nekojiru was apparently gripped by a compulsion to arm herself with a weapon. She would stand there in her army jacket with a completely serious look on her face and say, I want a knife. What she wanted really was something to protect her from the world. Once I got to know her, I felt I understood better how she could have come to the point of wanting to arm herself with a weapon. To Nekojiru, the world around her was a dangerous place full of awful and repellent people and things. She couldn't let her guard down for a moment, so she escaped into the, her own world. When even that wasn't enough, she wanted a knife. There were a few other special things about Nekojiru. She was unrelenting in her criticism of others to the point of selfishness. She could hardly eat anything, no fish, no meat. At restaurants, she would only order soup. Once, when she came to our house, my wife offered her an avocado. Try it, it's good. Nekojiro seemed mystified by the strange fruit. Itadakimasu! Nekojiro took a bite of the avocado. <laughs> a moment later, pieces of avocado were flying across the room. 
Nekojiro was perfectly satisfied with food you could suck from a straw. It's not that she was a picky about food, she just didn't care about food. In the end, she didn't care about living. And like my wife, she wasn't picky about gender and matters of love. Nekojiro's first love was a young woman. In her later years, her later years, she was on good terms with my wife. We dropped by her house often as newlyweds. It wasn't long until they were good friends. We visited each other at home, and we talked on the phone. You could sense that Nekojiro had only accepted my wife because of me. And to my wife, Nekojiro was like a family pet. She was constantly petting Nekojiro. Seeing them glued to one another was, was prone to give rise to misunderstandings. They were like two young maidens in a film by Renoir. Dazzling, beautiful, and erotic. And now both of them are gone. <clears throat> At one point I, contra I contracted Nekojiro to draw two pages of a manga for a travel magazine I was editing. I sensed it was best not to make too many demands, so I left it up to her to decide on the content. My sole request was for something in the vein of her debut, something with cats. I was reassured by the knowledge that Yamano was in fact the co-creator and manager of the cop ma cat manga. After all this time, I'm still amazed that she gave you the okay. She usually she does. Usually she never does. Yamano confided later. Why Nekojiro gave me the okay, why she accepted me, I don't know. Usually she rejected anyone who approached her. <coughs> Excuse me. And accepted only the people she had picked. By some miracle, I was among the elect. Perhaps it was because we were both right hemisphere types. Or perhaps because she sensed a kinship with me due to my childhood traumas. I had some serious traumas regarding my relationship with my parents. It was like Nekojiro's laser vision had bored right through my surface layers and into my soul. That intuition impressed me. I was fortunate enough to bear witness to several other instances of her intuitive prowess as time went on, and came to look on her as something of a shaman. One day I got up close and personal with the shaman in Nekojiro. It was back when I was living in an apartment the north side of Tokyo, drowning in hard drugs every day. One day, Nekojiro informed me, You'll be dead by 35. I went completely pale. Why am I going to be dead by thir at 35? A drug overdose? A hit and run? I don't want to die. I couldn't stop thinking about her ominous prediction. She had seen the shadow of death hovering over me, but her premonition, it turns out, had in fact been directed at herself. Why did Nekojiro, a shy and antisocial person, warn to someone like me? I also enjoyed talking to Nekojiro. Nekojiro had almost no friends, and she spent most of her time alone. Exceptionally, she was friends with an Israeli stallholder. She couldn't speak a world at word of English, but they got along well. Nekojiro didn't have any salaryman friends, and she didn't seem to want any. She was strict about acquaintances, and hard to please. For some reason, reason an Israeli stallholder and a freelance writer were okay. When I asked her what she thought of the mangaka, Takeshi Nomoto, she was respectful. He's a senpai who draws interesting manga. Not so much a friend as an elder she respected. Nomoto himself had a good eye for judging people, and had seen her potential since even before her debut. After her debut, as before, Nekojiro was unconcerned by the business side of her work. She had no interest in worldly ambitions like making money and getting famous. But a humble woman she was not. I knew nobody as unpredictable or as selfish as Nekojiro. She knew exactly what she wanted and took it. Garo didn't pay for manuscripts, so anyone who drew for him knew not to expect rem remuneration. Remunera remuneration. Having only drawn for the pages of Garo, Nekojiro later confided that she was grateful to me because I was the, pers the first person who had paid for her work. I had become something of a big brother to her. Yamano was a father and a mother to Nekojiro. She addressed Yamano as mom, and she addressed me as big brother. We were like a real family. It was short-lived, but it was real. Nekojiro, Masaki Ayoama, and Saki Tatsumi, all three knew one another, all three are gone. I eventually asked Nekojiro to draw 
a man draw manga for Abunai One Go, a magazine Aoyama and I edited. That's when Nakujiro got to know Aoyama, which is what led to him writing the afterword for her book, Nakujiro Dango. However, that had been arranged by the publisher. Nakujiro knew Aoyama through me, but they were never close. In the early 90s, Nakujiro still wasn't too busy, and she was able to work at her own pace. At the time, I was in, a, in the habit of going over to Nekojiru's house and spending the night listening to techno slash trance music. After, after discovering techno music, we often went out dancing at dingy club, clubs frequented by floor, foreigners or to Goa trance rave parties. We really loved the scene. I'd go over to Yamano's house, and the three of us would spend the night talking and tripping to the music. This was before Saki and I got married. Nekojiru and Saki would drink. I would smoke weed, and would spend the night music tripping. At the beginning, I had to explain everything to them. This is dub. It evolved from reggae. It, it's perfect with ganja. Or, this is German trance. It's all weepy sounding, with tinny scent. Wrapped up in our cells, we sat around all day doing nothing, just listening to music. Sudden barks of vacant laughter, followed by endless reams of useless music trivia, and talk about our favorite artists, life and death. Time flowing before our eyes, we were passengers on a ship of time bathed in a rain of music, riding into the light. Seen from the outside, we must have looked like a bunch of degenerates. Fearful but confident, at one with the universe, filled with ecstasy, we spent psychedelic days and nights dancing as if possessed. Worries about the future disappeared momentarily. Nekojiro was open to just about anything at the beginning, but soon enough she got to know the music and developed preferences. I like the faster stuff, or I like the more screechy sounding stuff. Finally, after listening to various things, she said her favorites were Aphex Twin and Hallucinogen, a Goa trance unit. Hallucinogen is one of the best Goa trance units for tripping to LSD. The only drug Nekojiro did while listening to music was Jack Daniels. She couldn't stand the more melodic, emotional, weepy types of music. The music of one of my favorite artists, Jam El Mar, seemed to please her at first, but with its, with its drugged out sound and complex musical structure. But she later did a 180 and said she hated it because it sounded too gay, quote unquote. Near the end, we usually wound up listening to whatever Nekojiro wanted. Goa trance being dance music. I would often move my arms to the music, and I remember Nekojiro staring and looking very amused when I did. Nekojiro never danced. She was the kind who sat still and went into herself. I remember once, when we were listening to the music, Nekojiro was in a particularly good mood and gave me a gift of a religious painting she had bought while on vacation in India, even though she was fond of the picture. She could be generous that way. We used the painting for the back cover of issue 2 of Abunai One Go. Nekujiru went on vacation and in, to India in 1994. I had said I wanted to go with her, but I wasn't able to get, off, get time off, so she went alone with Yamano. In Benares, she saw a holy man called Sado who would sit around all day smoking cannabis. Why can't Japan be that laid back? Why, why can't Japan be that laid back? She asked me. Nekojiro had never done drugs in Japan, but she tried cannabis in India and rather enjoyed its gentle intoxication. <sighs> Unsurprisingly, the reason Nekojiro got together with Yamana was because of his work on Garo. Nekojiro personally came knocking on his door and forced her way into his life. She had just graduated from beauty college, so she was around 18 or 19. Though practically a shut-in, Nekojiro had made up her mind that she wanted to help Yamana with his manga. The problem was, Nekojiro's drawings looked nothing like Yamano's. Yamano's manga was drawn in precise detail, but Nekojiro could only draw simple figures that looked amateurish, almost childish, but her drawings nevertheless had a mysterious appeal. Yamano had sensed something special about her drawings, so on instinct he collaborated with her on a story, just to see what would happen. That was how Nekojiro's debate, debut came about. From that point on, every once in a while she drew a new episodes in the Nekujiro Udon series, and I commissioned one pages and illustrations from her for my magazine. This was in the early 90s, before she had to worry about deadlines. The 
The stories were about Nyata and Nyako beating a dog for no reason, or seeing a homeless man, homeless bum getting drunk on a bus, running to tell their dad, and the homeless bum puking on dad. I enjoyed them because they were true to Nekojiro's feelings. <clears throat> The editors asked me to make it more accessible, but I sensed that these cats had real potential to take off, so I let her do as she pleased. Before becoming famous, Nekujiro lived in an, er, an irregular lifestyle, staying awake for 30 hours at a time or sleeping all day. It must have wreaked havoc on her circadian rhythm. Nekujiro had a cat. Her way of training her cat was a bit hard to stomach. When he did something he wasn't supposed to do, she lashed him with a whip. She sometimes used an amount of force with her cat that was clearly animal abuse. As a result, the cat didn't listen to Yamano or I, but never failed to follow Nekojiru's instructions. Nekojiru could be surprisingly persistent when she wanted something or someone. Usually nobody interested her, but when someone did, she was unstoppable. I once forced a guy, to li I, once forced a guy I liked to take my student notebook, Nekojiru told me. Her first target was the lead singer of the funk band, EP4, Kaoru Sato. The second was Yamano. Later in her life, she would even fell for Aphex Twin. Looks were important to Nekojiru. Richard D. James, aka Aphex Twin, though not handsome perhaps, has a sort of boyish good looks. His music was very personal, beautiful at times, violent at others. His music made you wonder how much of this is planned out and how much of it is pure instinct. It was playful and free, not to say random. Nekojiru fell for Aphex Twin through his music. Her feelings had become quite serious by the time the Richard D. James album came out. In accordance with her testament, they were joined forever in Nekojiru's casket. Though Nekojiru could be aggressively go-getter with people she liked, most people interested her no more than food did. Her disinterest was impartial. Pop stars mattered no more to her than fans of her work, than did fans of her work. She was unpleasant to everyone equally, pure in selfish selfishness. She liked few things and expressed her feelings concisely and emphatically. I don't care. I don't like it. Despite a recommendation from Hyde of Lar Lars Lar Lars Larsenciel Lar 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 on the cover of Nekajira's books and widespread suspicions of her suicide being a copycat of ex-Japan leader singer Hyde's suicide, the fact was Nekujiru wasn't interested in pop stars like them. She could be just as much of an idol worshipper as anyone, but her idols weren't the popular kind. She had her own clear set of preferences that had nothing to do with popularity or musical quality. I love Jack Daniels, nya, read a line in her manga. Nekujiru loved to drink. Once when we were at a restaurant, Nekujiru got drunk, and when the owner brought out a dish of grilled sweet fish on the house, Nekujiru became furious and made a big scene because we didn't ask for it. Otherwise, things rarely got out of hand when we got together to drink at Nekujiru's place in the early 90s, but by, my, by 1997 to 98, at the peak of her popularity, Nekujiru had started to drink heavily. Nekujiru had one other defining trait. She couldn't lie. It was physiologically impossible for her. That's why she said it loud and clear, as she didn't like something. Once we were eating with a friend at a sushi bar that we frequented because we often came up with interesting ideas there. As we sat qui quietly eating, suddenly Nekujiru blurted out, This row is disgusting. I bet it's fake. The noisy restaurant went dead silent. The cook stood rooted to the spot in front of us, knife hovering in midair, hovering in the air in mid-chop. Taken aback and uncertain what to do, I froze up. Once the initial shock had worn off, the cook was able to respond. I can assure you it's real. To try to save the situation, I gave it a good laugh to try to pass it off as a joke. Nekojiro was always honest, sometimes to the point of rudeness. Once she called up the editor of a major magazine in the middle of the night to make the following request. I want a different liaison. Why? the editor asked. Because he's fat. The editor couldn't believe his ears, so he asked again and again for the real reason, but she wouldn't give any other reason. 
Without solid justification for doing something so drastic, the editor must have been quite put out. In the end, I think she got her request. Nekojiro could be impulsive in an endearing way, but also self-centered. But she didn't do it to be mean. She didn't have anything against fat people. Her body seemed to, it, to experience a kind of sympathetic resonance and began to sweat uncontrollably whenever she was around them. She was unable to cope with the slightest stress that others could easily endure. She was too sensitive. I imagine the editors of the big publishing houses must have had their share of problems with her. Kid gloves must have been the order of the day. Can't stand most people. Gets depressed when she has to be around people she doesn't like. What a small-minded, unkind person she must have seemed from a distance. Natural and ingenuous to the point of arrogance. Nikojiro was baptized the Child Queen by Yamano. The title fit her to a T, pure and easily hurt, without the immune system to protect herself, yet haughty, turning her nose up at this and that. After molding her environment and her own image, all that was left for her to do was to shut her eyes and turn inward. Nekojiro had attempted to commit suicide in the past. Like my wife Saki, Nekojiro was a proud woman with her own view of the world. Saki was a left hemisphere type, logical and thoughtful. Nekojiro was a right hemisphere type, temperamental and turbulent. It was like she could see things other people couldn't. We may have gotten along because we were both right hemisphere types with a schizophrenic streak. A schizophrenic streak. Nekojiro's husband, Hajime Yamano, on the other hand, is level-headed, sensible, cool. It comes as more of a surprise that someone like Yamano could have created the sort of deranged manga he has. The creator of the more recent version of the manga, manga Nekojiro E, is in fact none other than Yamano. Nekujiro Y is in fact none other than Yamano. Yamano uses this name when he draws his manga, when he draws manga using Nekujiro's characters. Nekujiro Y's manga may look like Nekujiro's manga on the surface, but underneath it's a world apart. Nekujiro often got depressed and spent her time, spent her time holed up in a room playing Final Fantasy. I don't play video games, but I once played a fighting game with Nekojiro and she tore me to shreds. She laughed when she saw me getting irritated because I couldn't figure out the controls. <laughs> You're getting all mad. What caused Nekojiro to become closed in on herself? I've given the question a lot of thought, and the best answer I can come up with is that it must have happened when she was living with her family. By the time I met her, she was already completely shut off from the outside world. Nekojiro was seeing a psychiatrist. She had been diagnosed as manic depressive. I remember her saying on several occasions. I remember her saying on several occasions. I'm not afraid of death. Near the end of the publishing bubble, between 1992 and 94, sales were still pretty good. I had it easy, putting together books for fun, getting royalties on the sales, and then in turn get using the royalties to have more fun. Nekojiro was still free to work at her own pace, so there was a relaxed atmosphere about her work. We got together more often to have fun than we did to discuss work. She never seemed depressed when she was with me, but she may have just been hiding it. Things were going well and everybody was still alive, so it was a relatively happy time for us. Listening to our favorite music, having a bit of fun with drugs every once in a while, chatting about everything and nothing, time flew by. Around this time, dreams of making it big may even have taken root in Nekojiro. Buoyed on the waves of the publishing bubble, Aoyama had his own small but intensely devoted following, and in a sense was the most successful of, of us all. But there would come a time when Nekojiro would sell more books than even she could have imagined, and that was the beginning of the end for Nekojiro.
Suddenly, in the mid-90s, Nekojiro's popularity took off. The nation was swept by Nekojiro fever. The epithet uh, Abuna Kawaii was coined to describe the special appeal of her work. Cute and dangerous. The simple forms of the characters must have been a big factor in the sudden popularity. I also believe that to a large extent her work was accepted only because of its naive childish drawing style. Abuna Kawaii, the perfect word to describe Nekojiro's manga. It's particularly apt for the early works, with their innocent cruelty. Nekojiro herself even fit the bill, with her unfeigned innocence. From one moment to the next, Nekojiro was a star. Gone were the days when, sh when we could spend all night chatting and listening to music. Saki and I had married by that time, and Nekojiro and the Yamana were so busy they didn't even have time to sleep. With the sudden popularity came the need to produce her manga in large quantities, and that was something that was not in Nekojiro's character. It now became a battle with the deadline after deadline, and eventually she became overworked. Work no longer just from Garo, but from Tokyo Electric Company and everywhere in between. Asking someone to mass produce what were essentially personal whimsies, thrown off of fun with misguided inherent and inherently impossible. Asking someone to mass produce what were essentially personal whimsies thrown off for fun was misguided and inherently impossible, but she managed to do it anyway. No doubt this was partly Nekojiro's attempt to in in ingratiate herself with the big magazines. Neither Nekojiro nor Yamano could turn down work. They accepted everything that came. After years of scraping by, the logic of poverty had led them to the conclusion that it was wrong to turn down work. I remember thinking they should be a little more selective about the offers they accepted. When we speak of the manga artist Nekojiro, in fact we're referring to two people. Nekojiro herself, of course, but also her husband and collaborator, Hajime Yamano. You can summarize the situation by saying that the ideas of the right brain Nekojiro were arranged in dramatic form by the left brain Yamano. For the most part, the stories were based on dreams or things actually seen by Nekojiro. When things seemed a little too strange for reality, it's probably because they were based on one of her dreams. The line between reality and dreams seemed blurred when in Nekojiro's mind. The special way of seeing things is behind the unique version of the world in her stories. The encounters with strange people in her stories were a mix of reality and fiction. Yamano surely helped to mold Nekojiro's ideas into concrete form, but the division of labor is not at all clear. The collaboration consisted of the delicate tightrope act of translating the fragile madness of Nekojiro's ideas into a concrete form that anybody could understand. Like Siamese twins, there's no way of saying where Nekojiro ends and Yamano begins. In every story by Nekojiro, there's always more or less Yamano mixed in. But some stories do seem more purely Nekojiro. I think it's fair to say that her unpaid early work for Garo or, me, or for me, the work collected in books like Nekojiro Udon or Jiro Jiro Niki, is high proof of ne high proof Nekojiro. Here it's obvious she was coming up with the stories quite freely. On the other hand, you can sense that Yumano must have done the great burden of the work in the stories that they started having to churn out in large quantities only a short time later. With new publishers came new restrictions, and the stories had to meet those restrictions. It gets particularly striking with the serials like Neko no Kamisama, where it's clear how far they've had to go to accommodate the major publishers. The more they'd had to do so, the more effort Yamano had to make, so the more his style came to the fore. <clears throat> Stories like Invisible, written by Yamano based on the dream notes left behind by Nekojiro after her suicide, are clearly more Yamano than Nekojiro. Though identical on the surface, Nekojiro and Nekojiro Y are not the same. It's as if, shorn of his Siamese twin after the death of Nekojiro, Yamano had continued to publish under the name of the half-entity Nekojiro Y. Reading the collection of early works that is Nekojiro Udon could very easily become a traumatic experience for a delicate soul. Two cat siblings go around randomly killing whatever rubs them the wrong way. Whatever they dislike, they kill. The cuteness of the cats lures us into accepting their casual cruelty. It's an outlook that seems to bespeak at the very least an ounce of self-hatred, if not outright hatred of the entire human race. Whenever Nekojiro was talk talked about in the press, she was usually described in terms something like these. A mangaka with a cult following for her manga featuring cute cat characters committing casual acts of cruelty. 
casual acts of cruelty. If you think about it, it begins to seem like a despaired expression of resignation in the face of death, as if she were saying to people, we're all gonna die anyway. Suddenly the public goes crazy for Nakajiro's work because it's Abu no Kawaii. Short of reducing her work to such a simplistic formula, how else could hundreds of thousands of people suddenly have wanted to associate themselves with the story with such a dangerous message? Rather than relating to Nekojiro's message of we all die, clearly most people were simply reacting to the powerful aura emanated. Em <coughs> clearly, people were simply reacting to the powerful aura emitted by her simply drawn characters. In the end, that was the element that gained her a broad readership. All of Nekojiro's early work has, a, has a, the same uniquely trippy feeling. You could almost call it psychotic. I liked to refer to these early works as natural acid. In a sense, it feels like Nekojiro used her stories to play family. I don't know anything about her family, but she didn't have the, give the impression of being a family person. It seems probable that the family in her stories wasn't based on her own family, but was a sort of ideal family that Nekojiro wished she could have had. In all probability, the character Niyako was her, and the character Niyasu was Yamano. Nekojiro did have a real younger brother, but it seems unlikely that Niyata was based on him. Nekojiro Kinbunroku, uh, Nekojiro Travelogue, included in Nekojiro Shokuro, Nekojiro Diner, has Nekojiro traveling to various places and giving her impressions. In typical Nekojiro fashion, wherever she goes, she says it sucks but the editors really do only send her to places that suck. It's like they're doing it deliberately to get her to say bad things. Did they really think Neko Jiro would enjoy going to a popular theme park? Jiro Jiro Ryokoki Indohen, Jiro Jiro Travelogue India, more effectively translates Neko Jiro's unique viewpoint into a real situation, and is perhaps her most accessible book. It's a book I'm very fond of because it bursts with the romance of travel. She also drew an account of her experience of tasting Banglasi, yogurt with cannabis, while in India. The real Nekojiro comes through in her po late book, Juru Juru Niki, Juru Juru Diary. Many of the pages depict things supposedly seen by Nekojiro in her daily life, such as a woman shitting in the middle of the road. Sometimes you have to wonder if she really saw all of those things. Perhaps they were only thing. Perhaps they were things only Nekojiro could see. On February first, nineteen ninety-seven, Nekojiro and I went to see Aphex Twin live in concert. My memory of the event is as clear as if it had happened yesterday. It was at the Liquid Room in, Ka in Kabukicho, Shinjuku. The room was packed to the brim. There wasn't even room to move. DJ Silob was the opening band. I asked Nekojiro what she thought of the music. It sucks. Hurry up and get off the stage. Unusually for the club, about a third of the audience was sitting on the ground. Nekojiro pushed and shoved her way to the front of the stage to be near the DJ booth. Little old Nekojiro was practically tackling these big guys, pushing them out of her way. Though small and frail, she could muster tremendous power when driven. Finally, Silab left the DJ booth. Two songs from Mike Yusik and Richie's album started playing on the speakers. Richard was on. It's hard to say whether Aphex Twin's music is for dancing or for listening. The dance floor was split about evenly between people dancing and sitting. There may even have been more sitting. Nekojiro was moving her body to the rhythm in the first row. Her eyes never left the DJ booth for a moment. Richard, on the other hand, stood hunched over the turntable the whole time. His long hair fell down and covered his face during the entire performance. Fuck the audience, he seemed to be saying. Two teddy bears were duking it out behind Richard throughout the show, a photo of Richard's face taped over their faces. After about an hour, Richard abruptly left the stage. Nekojiro immediately left her spot and walked over to where Yamano and I were sitting near the back of the room. I've had enough. Let's go. The party was supposed to go all night, but Nekojiro wasn't interested in the other DJs. How was Richard? I asked. I couldn't see his face the whole time, but it was nice. I liked the teddy bears. Nekojiro was always like that, short sentences to the point. 
She could fu she could sound curt if you didn't know her, but she was actually the emotional type. Coming from her, a comment like that meant something like, Oh my god, it was so fucking amazing, I almost wet myself. In other words, she had fun. During the last few years of her life, Nekujiro's workload had increased to the point that she was really and truly overworked. By this time, it was no longer about drawing for fun. It was about making the deadline no matter what. In books like Jiro Jiro Nikki and Neko Kami-sama, Nekujiro often simply transcribed her stories she'd heard from other people. I deleted a whole book's worth of data from my PC I laminated to Nekujiro once. Later, the story turned out word for word in Nekujiro's manga. I once set a part-timer to go on a company outing to my place because I was too busy, and in Omiyage he brought me a, and as an Omiyage he brought me a plastic pouch of dried seaweed, the regular kind you could find at a corner stores everywhere, to sprinkle on breakfast with five individually wrapped portions inside. Mm. That story also found its way into her manga, word for word. Overworked, Nekujiro had run out of ideas, but she had deadlines to meet, and did the best she could to manage. She had a strong sense of responsibility, and always found a way to come through in the end. More than once she found herself cornered by several deadlines, and had to push herself to the brink of collapse to finish everything. Once I was at my office late at night, and I heard a knock on the door. Can I sleep here tonight? An emaciated and exhausted looking Yamano inquired. What happened? Well, Yumano hesitated. Apparently, Nekojiro had attacked him with a box cutter in a fit of rage. I had Yumano lie down on the couch and bought him a glass of water. It was hard to break the awkward silence. The phone rang. I picked it up. It was Nekojiro. I knew he'd be over there. Put Yasu on the phone. Yasu was Yumano's roommate. I can't. He's sleeping right now. I tried to calm her down, but nothing worked. Put Yasuo on the phone right now. He ran out to me. he ran out on me, so go wake him up and put him on the phone. She was furious. Her nerves were completely shot. Things like this happened all the time when the work got overwhelming near deadlines. Two people working as closely as they did were bound to break under the tension sooner or later. Usually it started with Nekojiro having a fit of rage, or more accurately, physically attacking Yamana. As I looked at Yumano splayed on the couch, visions of Nekojiro training her cat, Nyansuke, danced before my eyes. I refused to let Yumano go home out of fear for his safety. Before long, dawn broke. The sparrows began singing and the newspaper delivery truck passed by outside. Nekojiro must have calmed down by now. Yumano finally went back to home to Nekojiro. Nekojiro needs me, he said as he left. Looking back on it now, the root of all their problems was the poverty that convinced them they had to accept every commission once their books began selling. If they had been in a position to choose their work, Nekojiro might not have died so soon.
guys need to take a break. One day in 1998, at a time when Nekojiro and Yamana were in the midst of their hardest periods, my wife Saki and I paid a visit to the Nekojiro residence. It was about three weeks before Nekojiro's suicide. We sat together relaxing, listening to music. Nekojiro had a pair of speakers especially made for techno music in the shape of a dodecahedron with speakers on each face. The hi-hat came through particularly clearly on these speakers. Nekojiro said little and sat still, completely focused on the grating sound of the high-pitched techno. Yamana, exhausted from the long days and nights of work, seemed pained by the harsh sounds. Concerned, I suggested, let's listen to this and put on some ambient dub. Yamana seemed relieved, but Nekojiro, who preferred faster, more aggressive music, seemed d displeased by the more mellow music and sulked in her corner. Already on the edge from lack of sleep, the psychedelic trance only seemed to serve to put her more on edge. Nekojiro seemed to be in an unusually bad mood that day. Suddenly I became uneasy when I remembered how she was prone to saying, I'm not afraid of death. As we left that day, Yamano and Nekojiro watched us for a good while from the porch. I can still remember the pleading, spent expression on Yamano's face. Don't go. Stay a bit longer. Don't leave us alone. His eyes seemed to beg. After we left, I suppose they went back to work, but they were already at the end of the line. <clears throat> Chiyomi is dead. She committed suicide. You were one of her few friends, so I wanted to tell you right away. I learned of Nekojiro's death by a phone call from Yamana. They discovered her late, and rigor mortis had already set in. I learned of her death only a few hours after she was discovered. When we received the call, my, wef my wife and I were in Shinjuku and thinking of going to the IMAX. Yamana's call was a shock. Yamana did his best to remain calm. In the back of our minds, we all had the vague notion that this might happen one day but we never imagined she would actually go through with it. The movie was put on hold and we ran to Yamano. At that moment, I was more worried about Yamano than about Nekojiro. I couldn't imagine the shock of losing one's wife to death. At the time, I thought the most important thing, more important than mourning Nekojiro's death, was taking care of the person left behind. Nekojiro's expression was calm. There was no trace of suffering on her face, no trace of regrets of clinging to life. She seemed completely at peace. It made sense to me, but it was also slightly terrifying. A CD and a video of Aphex Twin were placed in her casket. Aphex Twin's ambient works too was played at her funeral. Mekojiro had written to do so in her will. Having attempted to commit suicide in the past, Nekojiro had written wills on a number of occasions. Her last extant will, in fact, dated from several years prior. However, at Yamana's discretion, not everything was done according to her will. Nekojiro didn't want a gravestone. Yamana thought her family would want a gravestone so they could give, they could visit her grave, so he had one made. But as if in a last act of defiance, the gravestone remains nameless. A single Sanskrit character decorates Nekojiro's gravestone. Yamana told me once what it meant, but I've forgotten. One line in Nekojiro's will, will reads, no discussion of possible motives. Yamano has for the most part refused all interviews. At the time, the sight of Yamano was so painful to me that I almost couldn't bear to look at him. Five years later, to think that now I stand in his position. S suicide hurts the people left behind. Nothing can describe the pain or erase it. Yamano only managed to endure it. As the Nekojiro unit became popular, they became increasingly busy until they became as inseparable as Siamese twins. Nothing can separate them. To separate them, you would have to have had to rip them apart. To do so would be to discard them, and you don't just easily discard a human being. For a couple in a relationship as close as Yamano and Nekojiro, the pain of losing that other half must have been unbearable. After Nekojiro's death, the abandoned half of the unit continued to release work in the Nekojiro series under the pseudonym of Nekojiro Y. 
Nekojiro and Nekojiro Y look identical on the surface, but deep down they're completely different. Not in the sense that the former was hand-drawn in analog where the latter is digitally drawn, but in philosophy. Nekojiro chose to die, and her work clearly reflect, reflects her longing for death. Yamano chose to live. That difference is immense and reflected in their work. Yamano's work is completely lacking in the dangerous trance-like mood of Nekojiro's work. Many readers have discovered the world of Nekojiro through Yamano's work done following the death of the Siamese twin. But those who read Nekojiro from this beginning may feel something is lacking in the new work. The longing for death is completely absent in the new work. It's what I suppose you would call healthy. Yamano has become healthy again. That's why he no longer draws the sort of vicious manga he used to draw. He's grown beyond negativity. When my wife committed suicide, committed suicide six years later in the fall of 2003, I found a pair of support in another person who had lost his wife to suicide, Yamano. He understood my feelings of instability at the time. As I was teetering on the edge of mental exhaustion, he pushed me in the right direction. Yamano had managed to overcome. That was a great comfort. Nekojiro's suicide made big headlines, almost certainly in no small part because it came so soon after the death of Hyde of ex-Japan. Nekojiro's suicide was also given superstar treatment. On May 28, 1998, the Shukan Shincho Weekly wrote, There has been idle speculation that her suicide might be a copycat of Hyde. However, as far as I know, she wasn't a fan of Hyde. Besides, she wasn't the type to copy other people. The person the manga magazine editor was referring to in this quote was the mangaka Nekojiro. His point, the only similarity was that both seemed to have a bright future ahead of them. Nekojiro began drawing manga after marrying the mangaka Hajime Yamano. She quickly gained a reputation for her style of manga that successfully breached the gap between cute kittens and cruelty. After handling a television ad for Tokyo Electric, she looked to be on her way up. The editor continues, as anyone will realize if they just read her manga, Beneath the surface, cuteness was a self-destructive, pessimistic attitude towards life and death. In recent work, she dismissed the earth as bound for annihilation, and laughed about how she almost went out of her mind after eating a magic mushroom in Bali. She was clearly teetering on the brink. If, we could, if only we could be as uninhibited as Nekojiro's cats. <clears throat> what could have made Nekojiro want to die? Overwork was certainly a factor. Dealing with the big publishers must also have been a source of stress. Then there's her predisposition for depression. But it's impossible to disregard the obvious signs in her work. The recurring, recurring theme of death's inevitability. The obvious disregard for life. Nekojiro was the purest person I knew. My wife called her authentic. Pure, authentic, natural acid, psychotic, shamanic. Words that spring to mind when I think of Nekojiro. It must have been impossible for someone of her purity and innocence to live in this world. In the, eight short, in the eight short years that I knew her, Nekojiro didn't change the slightest bit in terms of appearance or behavior. Most women would grow from childhood into adulthood, but it was like Nekojiro refused to grow. Old. They say sales of Nekojiro character goods exploded after her suicide. Dying made her a hit. Nekojiro probably wouldn't have cared one way or another. In any case, the living can never know what motivated the dead to take their lives. I'm surprised she even made it to the age of 31. If she lived as long as she did, it must have been because of Yamano. In the end, she wanted to die, so she died. That's all we can say for sure. No attachments to life. Endearing through this trait of Nekojiro's might have been it in one sense. Endearing, though, this trait of Nekojiro's might have been in one sense, it was terrifying in another. I'm the kind of person who wants to live as long and enjoy and as long and as enjoyable a life as possible, so I've always been somewhat scared of people who aren't afraid of death. But Nekojiro had lived long enough. Apparently she no longer needed this world. She wrung herself dry in a furious fit of work over the span of a few years, and went out in a puff of smoke. It's so elegant, it's almost scary. Perhaps she was trying to tell the world about herself and her books all this time. Kill or die. Given only one choice, the answer is obvious. I'll never forget this memory of Nekoju. At, at a rave once, I collapsed due to a combination of exhaustion, 
and drug overdose. I needed an ambulance. Seeing that I could barely stand, Nekojiro called the ambulance, made sure I got on safe safely, and waited worriedly for me until I came back from the hospital. Other friends who had accompanied me to the rave, including Masaki Aoyama and Osamu Tsurumi, had disappeared by then, presumably fearing possible arrest. Nekojiro wasn't afraid of dying, but she was afraid of a friend dying. She was selfish but caring. Today we left the rave. Together we left the rave and joined Yamato at an onsen. As I returned to my senses lying on the floor of a private room in the onsen, I was thankful to be alive, but also incredibly lonely. Tears began rolling down my cheeks. It's, an emba it's embarrassing to admit, but I couldn't stop crying. Why are you crying? Nekojiro came to my side and asked with a worried expression. She stayed by my side for a while. Perhaps she thought I might commit suicide if she didn't stay by my side. Are you all right? I had my arms over my face so I couldn't answer. How could you have done something like that to yourself when you could be so caring about others? I asked Nekojiro and I asked my wife, how could you leave behind the people you care for? Part of me doesn't want to accept the selfishness of their act. Nekojiro suddenly found her book selling. She probably didn't want to, but she had to accept all of the commissions that came her way. She worked hard and probably made a lot of money, but she didn't care about the money. She cared just as little about life. She predicted I would die at 35. Perhaps that's why she likes, liked me, because she sensed in me another soul on the verge of death. But I just act crazy. I don't want to die.